Before beginning the items on this evening's program, I should like to tell the listeners that it will be concluded with uh, the second half being comprised entirely of Dr. Van Allen's talk to the alumni at the Alumni Assembly in McBride Auditorium last Saturday afternoon. He was speaking on the role of research in the university. During the last two weeks, this program has presented Dr. Van Allen in interview, and he was largely defending United States progress in outer space. And during the last week, there has been considerable evidence in support of his contentions, although at times uh, the evidence was of a sensational nature. Of course, I refer to the Air Force controversy uh, over the lunar probe date. It was reported thus in the Washington Post and Times Herald on last Thursday. Air Secretary James Douglas yesterday publicly reproved Lieutenant General S.E. Anderson for discussing dates for Air Force moonshots. He said the general had no authority whatso whatsoever for announcing those dates. Douglas made his comment in a statement given to newsmen after talking with Anderson in Douglas's office. Anderson in a news conference at Milwaukee on Tuesday, said the Air Force would fire three lunar probe shots this year, the first in August, with the others scheduled for September and October. The Defense Department, within an hour after Anderson's news conference, said no final decision had been made on firing schedules and that any announcements would be made by the Advanced Research Projects Agency, ARPA. The statement was issued over the signature of Roy W. Johnson, director of ARPA. Douglas said yesterday that a decision on dates for firing the lunar probes would be decided by Johnson. Douglas said General Anderson had no authority whatsoever to discuss dates when such launchings may be attempted, as no final decision has been made by ARPA, the planning agency, uh, the so-called planning dates, rather, uh, quoted by General Anderson, should be wholly disregarded. ARPA also raised questions about Anderson's comment that the lunar shots would be designed to hit the moon, saying... No attempt will be made to achieve direct contact with the moon and the projects now assigned. Anderson declined through an aide to comment on Johnson's statement. The general said in Milwaukee, the Air Force will try to hit the moon with a modified missile designed to give some indication of its arrival. But Johnson said no attempt would be made to achieve direct contact with the moon and the projects now assigned. He added, there will be no attempt to make a direct impact. They will try to orbit the moon at best. At worst, they hope to get around the moon once. As for Anderson's target dates for the proposed moon shots, Johnson said in a statement, we have talked about a lot of dates. Right now it's touch and go whether we can do it that early. No final decision has been made. At about the same time, the Milwaukee Journal published this article entitled, Moon Called Heart Hard Target, Many Ways to Miss. There are many ways to miss the moon, any error except the slightest in aim, speed, or timing would send a rocket careening off into one of a number of alternate trajectories. This fact, well known to astronauts, is behind Washington's reticence in discussing moon probe schedules. Mindful of the fiasco that resulted from prior announcement of the first satellite launching attempt, the Vanguard project, the White House said in March that it was not intended to speculate on moon probe dates. The Russians have been completely silent on their plans, although it recently has become known that they began working on alternate moon trajectories as early as 1953. From then until 1955, more than 600 such flight paths were ground out by Soviet electronic computers using various speeds, aims, and different relative positions of Earth and Moon. Computers are known to have been in short supply in the Soviet Union. Their allocation to such work shows the Russians are in earnest about their moon probe program. Among the alternative flight paths computed by Soviet and American scientists are, one, the rocket could miss the moon but be caught by its gravity long enough to circle the moon and return to Earth, describing a figure eight. Two, the rocket could miss the moon by a wider margin, circling back to Earth without rounding the moon. This elongated Earth satellite orbit would be used to photograph the far side of the moon. And three, the rocket could miss the moon, yet receive enough tug from the moon's gravity to boost its speed past the velocity needed to escape the Earth's gravity. It then would, sa would sail off into space to be captured by another planet 
or the sun itself. In each of these cases, there are a number of variations. Both Soviet and American students of celestial mechanics say that it would not be possible for the rocket to be captured by the moon remaining in orbit around that body. The most economical way to reach the moon is to have just enough speed upon exit from the Earth's atmosphere to coast to the point where the vehicle begins falling toward the moon. This point is about nine-tenths of the way. The required initial velocity is roughly 24,000 miles an hour. In comparison, it takes 18,000 miles an hour to place a satellite in orbit around the Earth just above the atmosphere. It takes about 25,500 miles an hour to escape from the Earth's gravity in any direction other than toward the moon. In each of these cases, the rocket burns out as soon as it has left the atmosphere and has reached the required velocity. In theory, slower speeds could be used if the rocket burned the whole way, but the fuel required in terms of present non-nuclear fuel efficiencies would be prohibitive. In supplementing the White House announcement of the moon probe program on March 27th, the Defense Department said, many test rocket launchings will probably be required before a probe is successfully placed in the vicinity of the moon. It was added that during the last several months, much groundwork has been done on these projects. Meanwhile, on last Thursday, the Washington Post and Times Herald wrote as follows in regard to the Senate bill for a space agency. This article was written by Raymond Law. A special Senate committee unanimous, unanimously approved a bill yesterday to establish an all-powerful agency to push American exploration into the realm of the limitless, limitless unknown of outer space. The bill laid before the Senate would set up a National Aeronautics and Space Agency, NASA, to be headed by a civilian director subject to policy guidance from a seven-member board. The bill was aimed at accelerating the United States program to overtake Russia's Sputnik achievement. This is the special urgency of our space adventure, the committee said. But it also stated this country's space activity should be devoted to peaceful purposes for the benefit of all mankind. The committee said the opening of space could mean an age of progress or an age of destruction. In either event, it said, we have no national option but to marshal our resources, order our course, and proceed beyond the shelter and sanctuary of Earth's atmosphere into this realm of the limitless unknown. The provision for the policy board was added by the Senate committee. It was not included in the administration bill or arrival measure already passed by the House. Under the provision, the civilian director would be the operating head of the agency, but he would be subject to policy guidance laid down by the board. The board would be responsible for a continuing survey of space activities, recommending programs and designating responsibility for major projects. The Secretary of Defense, who would be a member, would be authorized to appeal to the President if he were dissatisfied with any action of the board. Other members would include the Secretaries of State and Defense, the Director of the new agency, the Chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission, and three other presidential appointees. These three appointees, the director and his deputy, would be subject to Senate confirmation. Only one of the three additional appointees could come from the Defense Department so that only two of the seven members could represent the military. A policy declaration in the bill called for civilian control of aeronautics and space activities except for those programs involving development of, of weapons or military operations which would be under the Defense Department. The bill set forth these objectives expansion of human knowledge about the atmosphere and space, improvement of aircraft, development of vehicles carrying equipment and living organisms into space, long-range studies of space activities for peaceful and scientific purposes, preservation of the role of the United States as a leader in aeronautical and space science and technology, making information of military importance available to defense agencies, cooperation with other nations in space exploration, and most effective use of United States resources to avoid unnecessary duplication of work. Also on Thursday, Jack Raymond, writing in the New York Times News Service about the same bill, uh, headlined his article, Space Bills of Two Houses Miles Apart. He said, the bill prepared under the chairmanship of Majority Leader Lyndon B. Johnson of Texas is markedly different from a bill the House passed. It may run into some administration opposition, too. Johnson stressed the features of civilian control in the Senate bill. However, civilian influence would be far less effective than under the House Committee's bill. 
The bill calls for the establishment of a national astronautics and space agency headed by a civilian, but it also specifically accepts from its responsibility and direction activities primarily associated with weapons development or regarded by the Defense Department as military operations. In the House bill, the exception is noted only in that the civilian agency may cooperate with the Defense Department on military matters. The Senate Committee's bill establishes in the Executive Office of the President a Space Policy Board of seven members. In the House bill, a proposed 17-man board would be largely advisory. The Senate bill also would create a joint committee of the House and Senate to deal with a new agency. The House bill provides for separate Senate and House committees. The House bill appears to be closer to the original proposal for a civilian space agency sent to Congress by President Eisenhower. I should also like to call attention to those of you who would be interested uh, that there is an article in the science section of the June 7th Saturday Review. It's called Missiles Can't Conquer Space, and it's by Captain Robert Truax of the Advanced Research Projects, uh, Projects Agency, the ARPA, uh, which I referred to earlier. And one final note, this is from the Smithsonian Institution, a news release which says that the first published collection of optical observations of satellites 1957 Alpha and 1957 Beta, those would be the Sputniks, covering the entire lifetime of the first two artificial Earth satellites has just been released by the Smithsonian Institution. As part of their activities in connection with the International Geophysical Year, scientists of the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory at Cambridge, Massachusetts have compiled the observations reported by Moonwatch teams and observatories all over the world, including the information as released from day to day by the USSR. Also included in the collection of 12 reports are preliminary analyses of data from which the Smithsonian scientists have obtained new values of the density of the upper atmosphere, additional information about the shape of the Earth, and a more precise knowledge of how atmospheric drag affects the motions of satellites in their orbits. Of interest to the layman, as well as the scientist, the publication gives an explanation of the notation system devised to distinguish the various satellites and their component parts, a glossary of astronomical terms and symbols used in connection with satellites, and a chart for finding a satellite's distance and elevation. The information contained in this publication can now form the basis for further analyses by researchers everywhere that will produce new knowledge about our world and the space around it. The book available to the interested layman as well as scientists may be purchased from the Superintendent of Documents, Government Printing Office, Washington 25, D.C. For some time, we have mentioned that the International Geophysical Year might serve as the beginning of cooperation among nations, which in time could enter into the field of politics. The New York Times, in an editorial on June 8th, last Sunday, a week ago Sunday, wrote similarly in discussing the Antarctic. Whatever may have been in the minds of the original proponents of an international geophysical year, the concept and its studies have brought about a new political development that may be valuable. President Eisenhower has urged an international treaty that would minimize territorial claims in the Antarctic, or at least freeze them at their present status, and permit further peaceful research in the area to the advantage of all. Eleven nations have now responded favorably to support the negotiation of such a treaty. This acceptance of the proposal is heartening. There are many conflicting sovereignty claims in this region. They have proved in the past to be a stumbling block to agreement to proposals for any sort of joint operations or mutual understandings. Some of the air of hostility and misunderstanding seems to have been cleared. There is an opportunity for progress. Various expeditions that have been part of the work of the geophysical year have made contributions to a better knowledge of the significance of this largely unexplored area. Further gains can be made in this field only if there is a climate of international confidence. Territorial rivalries will not promote scientific knowledge, nor can or should the data collected and proved by any one group be obliged to stand alone. Cooperation is absolutely imperative. It has been suggested that this may indeed prove to be something of a laboratory for peaceful development to the benefit of all. At this stage, this seems to be more than a little optimistic. Some of the rivalries and suspicions will die hard. Moreover, some machinery must be devised to make any agreement that is reached self-enforcing. Nevertheless, a sound proposal has been made by President Eisenhower. It has been received with wide acclaim. It has now been officially endorsed by 11 states. 
A conference to explore its possibilities is clearly in the making. The Antarctic could just possibly be a pilot plant in the construction of a durable peace. And there is a brief article in the current IGY bulletin from the National Committee for the International Geophysical Year, the National Academy of Sciences bulletin, which points out that in February, scientists of seven nations met in Wellington, New Zealand uh, to discuss and compare their findings about the Antarctic. And now we should like to invite you to listen to the talk delivered last Saturday afternoon by Dr. James Van Allen, head of the SUI Physics Department, uh, before a group of assembled alumni. The talk was entitled, The Role of Research in the Universities. 